again. Is that better? All right. I've uh, heard this week of someone that works most Sundays and watches at McDonald's on their lunch break. So whether you're here live, whether you are watching streaming at home, or whether you're McDonald's on lunch break, we are glad to have you joining us today as we look in God's Word. And uh, we're in Matthew chapter 13. And before we dive into our parable, I want to go back to the Old Testament. There was a prophet named Nathan. And Nathan got the most difficult and most dangerous assignment any prophet ever got. God told him to go to King David and tell King David David had sinned. Now, let's face it. Confronting just about anybody over their sin is seldom well received. Most people will acknowledge they're not perfect. And then you agree with them and start offering observations that validate what they say. And they get really upset. It's like, but you said you weren't perfect. I'm agreeing with you. It gets even worse when it's a king or queen with unchecked power. Thomas More lost his head because he happened to tell the king he didn't agree with his divorce and remarriage. That's historically what happens, right? Even in the Bible. Elijah confronted Ahab, and he spent the next three years as an exile, number one on Israel's most wanted list. Jeremiah wrote a letter to King Jehoiakim, and King Jehoiakim cut the letter in pieces, threw it in a fire, and Jeremiah ends up spending time in a pit. Isaiah confronted Ahaz, and it did no good but get Ahaz mad at Isaiah. That's generally what happens. And Nathan has to go to King David. And he goes to King David. And he looks at King David, and he says, David, you've sinned. And he waits for the anger. He waits for the retribution. And all he gets is repentance. David repented. No prison sentence for Nathan. No lecture. No, do you know who I am? Just tears and repentance. What made the difference between David's response and that of the other kings? David's heart was not hard to God. That's it. See, we're at a transition point in Jesus' ministry. At this point in Matthew 13, Jesus begins talking and teaching in parables. Now we'll look at the why for that another time, but it's a transition. He starts telling stories. And he starts with this parable, the story of the soils. In fact, he calls it the chief of all parables. He tells the parable, and the disciples come, and they're like, we don't understand what you're talking about. And he said, look, if you can't understand this, the chief of all parables, how are you going to understand any of the parables? So he tells this parable, and it's a parable about the Word of God and the hearts of men and women. Now, ignorance of this parable, forgetting it or not understanding it, has allowed a lot of wrong thinking in our time. And wrong thinking always produces wrong behavior. So what's the wrong thinking that has come about in our world, in in Christian circles? Because of this parable not being understood. First is diminish the perceived value of God's word in being under the teaching of God's word. The whole point of this parable is that God's word is sown. It's, pro, it's broadcast. And some people receive it and their lives are changed. And we live in a world today, even where a lot of Christians have started to dismiss the value of God's Word and the value of them being under the teaching of God's Word. It also leads about a de-emphasis on personal responsibility. Now, one thing we need to understand about parables that people get really frustrated about when you teach about a parable We're called to teach the whole counsel of God. We're not called to do it in one sermon. Okay? So most parables deal with one truth. 
And some people get really frustrated when you actually just teach what Jesus taught about a parable. They're like, well, you didn't say anything about God's working in this or in this. And it's like, okay, but that's not in the parable. Well, it's over in Malachi 3, okay, but it's not in what we're talking about today. And so there are a lot of things that are true and biblical, but aren't part of this parable. So we want to see what Jesus is talking about. And what he's talking about is this. He's not talking about God's part in our salvation and sanctification. He's not talking about the preacher's part. He's talking about your part. He's talking about the part of the person who hears God's word. See, this is why two people can come to the same service or go to the same Sunday school class or hear the same Bible study. And they can hear the same teacher proclaim the same message from God's Word. And one of them leave and their life is forever changed. And the other one leaves and says, oh, I've heard all that before. Same message, same seed, same sower, different heart. And your heart determines what you receive. I remember growing up, uh, our our, our church, the pastor normally would announce guest preachers coming in. There was an evangelist guy from Alabama, country preacher. He was awesome. They'd announce him months ahead of time because everybody was going to come and hear Junior Hill. We had some great missionaries who would come. They'd announce him well ahead of time. Except for this pastor named Homer. Homer had been the pastor's wife's pastor when she was growing up. And I don't know if he used to be interesting, but if so, it had stopped years and decades before. He was the most boring, monotone preacher I'd ever heard in my life. They'd normally sneak him in on a Sunday night, and you'd walk in and be like, oh, great, homeless preacher. No. (laughs) And we're sitting there one night, and it's Homer, and you're like, oh, great. And he said something that immensely convicted me. He said, you know, some of you came tonight and you're wanting a bucket full of blessing, but all you brought was a thimble. God can only feel what you brought. And he said, don't blame me if you only get a thimble full of blessing when all you brought was a thimble. If you wanted a bucket full of blessing, you should have brought a bucket. And I wonder how many times we come under God's teaching and for whatever reason we bring a thimble, and we complain because we only get a thimble full of blessing. Your heart determines what you receive. We also see, because of a misunderstanding of this parable, a devaluing of youth ministry. You hear people say today, well, so many young people are coming from our churches and and, and falling away, and something's wrong with them. And, And people who do this end up devaluing youth ministry And they ignore the fact that falling away is not new and it's not relegated to youth. Jesus warns in this parable that there are a lot of people who fall away. And many of them aren't young. People have been falling away from the faith since there was a faith to fall away from. John 6, Jesus had many of his followers turn around and leave. Peter writes about a guy, Demas. Demas is mentioned three or four times in the New Testament. Paul calls him my co-laborer, my fellow worker, someone that sacrificed with Paul to plant churches. And when Paul writes in 1 Timothy, or in 2 Timothy, he says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. John writes in the 1 John 2 of people that fell away in his day. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain to all that they are not of us. Notice he makes clear these were never true believers. Before a season, they looked and acted and talked like believers. Not understanding this parable can also bring about a false sense of pride and security in those older in their faith. Yes, I've known quite a few young people who went away to college and lost their faith. But you know what? I've known a lot of older people who were once faithful, who were once committed, who once loved and served God. I've watched them fall away too. 
So don't think just because you're older, you're immune from falling away. In fact, someone pointed out that most of the people who failed in the Bible did so in the second half of their life, not the first. Finally, it leads to a sense of devaluing evangelism. I hear over and over because oh, evangelism doesn't work today. And you know what? That idea of falling away, because, because sometimes we share the gospel, we don't see people coming to Christ, it leads us to believe because it doesn't work every time, it doesn't work. And Jesus said, look, even in his ministry, not everybody who heard him received. If Jesus didn't have a 100% success rate, you and I won't either. And this led to this idea that we stopped trying to evangelize, we stopped trying to share our faith. And so we come to this parable in chapter 13, verse 1. <coughs> that same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him. So he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood on the beach. You know, I know we're meeting in a gym, not in the auditorium, not on cushioned chairs. They have no air conditioning, and they're all standing. It could be worse, right? All right, I appreciate the air conditioning, I appreciate the sound system, I appreciate having chairs. And Jesus is on a boat, and the crowd's standing on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and devoured them. So in those days, the farm would go and broadcast, they called it, he would scatter seed, and the seed would fall on different soils. And some of that seed would fall on hard ground, the path. The path is where they walked between the fields. And after a while, that became so hard that it was impenetrable. And so the seed would not fall into the dirt. It just laid there. And the birds came and would eat the seed. And then other seed fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. But then when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. There was no depth of soil. It could not maintain moisture. So it sprang up quickly and left and died just as quickly. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. And other seed fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let it hear. So two other types of soil we see. One is the thorns and weeds. And this seed has enough room to start sprouting. It, the soil is open enough to receive the seed, but it does not have enough room to grow. The weeds do not give it enough to fully produce. And the other seed, it says, fell on good soil. Some seed fell on good soil. And the good soil grew and was fruitful and produced. Father, we come before you today and pray, Lord, you would be with us this morning as we look in your word. That you would examine our hearts this morning as we listen. That we would be open to you, that we would hear your word, and that we would respond. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So he says, hear then the parable of the sower. In Mark's gospel, it tells us very clearly the sower is anyone who shares God's word. Whether it's a preacher, a teacher, whether it's someone in a children's Sunday school class, or one, a, a youth worker, whether it's a Bible study teacher, whether it's someone in a life group, whether it's a friend sitting down with another friend over coffee, whether it's someone walking down the street sharing the gospel with a stranger. Anyone who shares God's word is this sower. And we're broadcasting the seed. And this is how the kingdom of God advances in the world, by sharing of God's word. Not through the accumulation of money, not through the passing of laws, not through gaining military or political power. It is through the sharing of God's word. That's what the Bible says that, Paul says the gospel, it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone who believes. So, God's word spreads through people sowing or sharing his word. And as we share his word, 
we're going to have to understand that it's going to fall on different types of hearts. Jesus makes it clear that the heart is the soil. And some people, the word falls and they do not understand it. The word understand in the Greek comes from two words, meaning with and to put to. We get our word synthetic or synthesized from it. It, it means to put together, to put with. And so these people hear God's word, but they do not put it together. Their hearts are hard. They dismiss it. As a result, the evil one, Satan, comes and snatches away what has been sown in their heart. This was sown on the path. It's interesting in both of these two parables, this week and the next weeks, we're going to see Satan plays an interesting and significant role in both of them. So these people are hard. They have no response to the gospel. This is probably the easiest type of soil to recognize. They make no claims. They make no pretense of interest in the gospel. The other kind is one is sown on rocky ground. This is one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Now notice this word immediately. They immediately receive it. They get excited. I was talking to a church planner this week and um, he had a guy come and I told him, I was like, that guy's not going to stay long. The guy was just overjoyed with their ministry and how things are going. And I, I've learned when people come to church and they come to one service and they leave and they're like, oh, this is the perfect church. I've looked my whole life for this church. Everything's wonderful. They're not staying long because we're not that perfect, right? I mean, I, they, they're going to find out eventually. It, it's like the person that gets married because of someone's online dating profile. You meet them and get to know them and you're like, okay, I, they don't look like that picture, right? No church is perfect. And so what happens is some people, they spring up real quick. I remember when we were in South Carolina, there was a guy, Tim, came forward the invitation, and Tim was just at everything. By all appearances, he was on fire for God. I mean, the doors were open, he was there. He was volunteering for everything. And for about three or four months, this went on. And then one day, Tim just dropped off the face of the earth. I caught up with Tim, and I said, hey, Tim, what's going on? Is there anything you know, we can help you with? And he said, well, he said, I'll be honest with you. I thought if I got right with God and I started serving God, he'd give me my wife back. But my wife just got engaged to someone else. And I'm like, well, so Tim, you really didn't get right with God. You were just trying to use God. But see, for a short period of time, he sprung up. For a short period of time, these people look really, really good. But notice, they immediately receive it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself. There's no depth. They endure for a while. And when tribulation and persecution arise on account of the word, immediately they fall away. These don't fall away slowly. They fall away quickly. They wanted to use God for blessing. They did not want God in the midst of persecution and suffering. They're like uh, Wilbur Reese wrote, I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep. Just enough to equal a cup of warm water or warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of God to make me love a black man or pick beets with a migrant. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I would like to buy $3 worth of God. Many fall away because they were never truly followers of Christ. They wanted the comfort, not the suffering. Someone went to a college professor once and said, I, I knew so-and-so, and they were one of your students. And the professor said, he may have attended some of my lectures, but he was never one of my students. And these are people who they may have come to church, they may have so, shown some spiritual interest for a moment, but they were never following Christ. And when things get hard, they fall away. <coughs> There's another type of soil. As for that, what was sown among thorns, 
This is one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. I like the way Luke's account of this says, they bore no fruit to maturity. They started to produce fruit, but the fruit never matured. Now, like I said, we have to be careful in pushing parables too far. And there are different views. I, I, I am of the opinion that these are Christians. These are people who God has had growth in their life. The seed has grown. But they never produce much fruit because they've allowed God's word to be choked out by other things. Notice what it's choked out on. It's crowded out. See, they have not made room for God in their hearts. There are three things that we see. One is the cares of this world. The word cares, it, means, it comes to the word means divided or cut in two. Their hearts and minds are divided. The cares of this world are greater than their interest in God. The worries, the burdens. The Bible uses this word when it says, cast all your cares on him. Are your thoughts more dominated by the things the internet and news tell you to be afraid of or the God the Bible tells you to trust in? Faith and fear cannot dwell in the same heart. It's interesting to me, the most repeated command of the Bible is do not be afraid or fear not. And I see so many Christians that are consumed with fear. Do you know why? Because you keep pouring fertilizer on your fear. You keep going to the same news outlets, the same media sources that are stirring up fear. And all you're doing is you're fertilizing your weeds. And you're surprised that it is crowding out faith in God's word. Let me tell you something. If you go to a source of information... And every time you go to it, all you do is come out more afraid. You need to change where you're going. Right? You need to find places that are stirring your faith rather than your fear. You're like, Pastor, but there is so much to be afraid of. And then you talk to people who are consumed with fear. If you're not as scared as they are, they say, because you don't understand how bad things are. Maybe it's not that. Maybe it's because I understand how good God is. Because you know what? There's a litany of stuff I'm told every day I need to be afraid of. The weather. Politicians. Pick your party. I'm kind of scared of both of them, to be honest with you. Um, Health. I read the other day there's this new virus out that is the most deadly one ever. And this is like the 15th one of these we've had. Now, don't worry, I'm not saying people can't get sick. But, but, are we far enough away from COVID I can say it? I think we can. If not, this was Dan's idea, and I told him. (laughs) It amazes me how many people a few years ago were told to stay away from your friends and family. And you did it. There's always something to be afraid of. And the Bible doesn't say we don't take reasonable precautions. Wash your hands, lock your car doors. All right? But trust in God. Here's another fear, another weed, another thorn. The deceitfulness of riches. I like that term, the deceitfulness of riches. Riches deceive. See, we're told that the key to happiness is to have enough money. No one ever tells us how much is enough. I I, I like sports, but sometimes I I laugh at professional athletes. There was a quarterback recently who his team offered him a $45 million a year contract. And he said they were disrespecting him. And he was just trying to make sure he had enough to take care of his family. I I just want you all to know, if any of you want to give me $45 million, I think we can make it this year. Right, um, My wife handles the budget. I'll talk to her. We may have to make some cutbacks somewhere, but I think we can make it. So here's the problem with putting trust in money. It's never enough. If your security is in your IRA or your bank account, 
what's enough? There's never enough. And people are told that the riches are the key to happiness. That riches are the key to security and safety. But it's never enough. That's why Timothy write, or Paul writes to Timothy, charge those who are rich in this world that they be not high-minded or trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives richly all things to enjoy, that they be generous, willing to distribute, storing for them, up for themselves a good inheritance in the future to come. See, we've bought in this idea that my security is in my money, not in God. How much is enough? There's a third one that's found in Luke and Mark. The pleasures, or literally the lust of this life, the desires of this life. Those fleshly desires to say, I have to do this or have this to be happy. Whether it's sex or some other form of pleasure, cigarettes, some kind of food, whatever it be, when it consumes my life. And these things crowd out God's working in our life. The interesting thing about these, these people don't fall away quickly. They fall away slowly. The first group fell away quickly. These fall away slowly. It takes time for weeds to grow. And because it happens slowly, it's harder to recognize when it's happening to other people and when it's happening to us. Let me ask you a question. How much room is there in your heart today for Jesus? How much maturity are you seeing in the fruit in your life? Is your life so full of other things that God's Word cannot grow there? The latter fall away suddenly, these do gradually. Then finally, as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the Word and understands it. He indeed bear fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another 60, and in another 30. So I want to just bring <clears throat> conclusion, three points of application. First is this. Each person is the cultivator of his or her own heart. You are responsible for the condition of your heart. Especially if you're very old. I talk to people sometimes, and they're 50, 60 year old, and they're still talking about the problems mom and dad. I'm like, at some point, the statutes of limitations run out on blaming your parents for your problems. I'm not saying it doesn't impact us, but at some point, you've had 40 years to deal with those issues. At some point, it's time to move on. At some point, it's time to say, you know what? I was telling someone the other day, I've been here over five years now as a senior pastor. At some point, I, got, I, I can't keep blaming the last guy, right? At some point, I have to take responsibility. The same is true of your heart. You are the cultivator of your heart. And if your heart has weeds, guess whose fault it is for letting them grow? If your heart's hard, if there are rocks there, it's your fault. Deal with it. By the way, let me add this. Do not assume your good soil. Do not assume your good soil. Principle number two, soils change. Soils change. Someone might have been hard, bad soil a year ago, but you know what? Today their soil may be different. Soils change. We grew up, we had an acre yard, and most of the ground was in the backyard, and my dad had a big garden. And over the course of our childhood and my life there, we worked in the garden. And we would till the soil, and we'd throw grass clippings in there, and we'd throw vegetables and coffee grinds, and then we'd go and we'd till it. And then in the summer, we'd pull the weeds. My dad would tell us, he, he said, you know what, I'll give you all $20 to pull the weeds in the garden this summer. And you think about it, it was a bad deal, but here was the reality. If we said no, we were pulling the weeds anyway. Might as well get 20 bucks for it. And you know what I found out? Pulling weeds is hard work. He would encourage us to get up early in the morning before it was hot. And it was like, that didn't sound appealing to a kid on summer break. And then you go out there at like 1 in the afternoon in South Carolina. That doesn't sound appealing either. 
It's hard work to prepare soil. But you know what? By the time I left there 20 years later, that soil was so rich. You, you had earthworms the size of your finger. It was dark, rich. You could show that soil a picture of tomatoes, and they'd start sprouting up. It was good soil. All right, that might be a slight exaggeration. <coughs> Some hearts take time. But let me say this as well. Don't assume just because your heart was good last year that it's still good today. Some of us want to judge our heart on what it used to be. And we don't want to pay attention to the weeds that are growing in their day. Soils change. Let me add, don't try to judge other people's soil. You and I aren't real good at that. You know, I was a youth pastor for about 10 years, and I, I, I've been removed from that long enough that I can see where a lot of those kids are now. And they're some of the ones that, that seem to be the most attentive, the most faithful, the ones I would have thought the most sure that God was working in. And I've seen them fall away. And there are other kids that I would have thought, you know, a kid like Garrett. Garrett was, a, in his own words, a street thug from New York. He was getting in trouble with gangs. So his parents sent him to live with his Aunt Regina in South Carolina. So first night, Garrett shows up. It's like middle of July, 95, 96 degrees, 100% humidity. And Garrett's wearing these long black jeans, this thick black hoodie sweatshirt with a toboggan on his head. And you go up Garrett and say, hey, Garrett, how's it going? All right. Get one word answer was success. That was all you got. I'd made a commitment to God that any teenager who came to the youth group, I'd go and share the gospel with. So I went over to Regina's house, knocked on the door, and said, Hey, can I? Is Garrett home? And she said, Garrett, come out here. He said, I'm playing video games. She said, The preacher's here. Get out of here. So now, not only was I trying to talk to this kid, but he had to give up his video games. So he came out, and I started talking to him, and I asked him if I could share the gospel. And he said, Yeah. So I shared the gospel. He said, I'll do that. And he prayed to accept Christ and never saw much change, never saw any difference. I'll be honest with you, I don't know that I thought to expect much. Next year we have teen camp, and after our morning message, everybody's going to lunch. And I'm walking down the hallway, going to the cafeteria, and Garrett says, Mr. Whitney. I said, yeah. He said, where's your Bible? I said, in my room. He said, go get it. I said, yes, sir. So I go and get my Bible, come out. He's got two chairs sitting in the middle of the hallway. He said, sit down. I was like, okay. Guess I'm not getting a burger right now. So I sit down. He said, do you remember when you came over to Aunt Regina's house? I said, yeah. He said, do you remember what you showed me? I said, yeah. He said, show me again. I said, okay. Opened the Bible, went through the gospel again. I don't know whether he got saved before, whether he got saved there. I know that from that moment on, we had a changed man. Hardly a Wednesday youth act meeting went over that Garrett wouldn't come and say, hey, I need you to pray for so-and-so. I've been talking to him at, church, at school. I've been sharing the gospel. One day I get this call on a Friday. This guy calls. I'm like, hello. He's like, are you Garrett's youth pastor? I'm like, yeah. Who are you? He said, I'm his friend from school. I, I got some car problems. He told me you'd help me. I'm like, okay, I guess I will. <laughs> Finally, he was moving back to New York, and he came. He said, I got a problem. He said, my best friend's a Jehovah's Witness. And I don't know all they believe, but I've been reading some of that. It's not right with the Bible. Can you help me know how to share the gospel with my friend? I mean, here's this 17-year-old who's been saved about a year, who's asking me how to help him share the gospel with Jehovah's Witnesses. I know Christians have been saved 40 years. They see a Jehovah's Witness coming down the street. They're locking the doors, closing the blinds. Kids, tell nobody's home. Like, heaven forbid, someone walking down the street, knocking on the door, saying, would you like to talk about Jesus? And we don't want to. See, I made the mistake of thinking I could judge soil. I can't. I'm not called to. I'm just called to share seed. I'm called to throw out the seed. I'm not called to try to figure out which soil's going to be receptive. Third thing, understand this. Good seed grows slowly. Good seed grows slowly. 
That's why it's hard to tell good soil. You plant today, it doesn't come up today. Very often it takes weeks and months and years. A number of years ago when we were in South Carolina, I, I saw in the news that they had had an unusual rainfall in Death Valley, California. And these flowers were shooting up, some of which had not been seen in 75 to 100 years. People are going from all over the world to Death Valley, California to see this. And I'm a little slower than some people. I left, got my car, was driving to work, and it occurred to me. If those flowers had not been seen for 75 to 100 years, that means that seed had to have been sitting there for 75 to 100 years, waiting for conditions to be just right. Don't get discouraged because you've placed some seed and haven't seen the fruits of it yet. It may just be sitting there waiting for the right condition. You know what? Keep sowing good seed. Sow seeds and some will completely reject your message. Sow anyway. Sow seeds and some will seem to have been fruitful only to disappoint you and fall away. Sow seed anyway. Some seeds will begin to grow only to be choked out. So anyway. Why? Because some will fall on good soil. And you might not even know it was on good soil. But it will grow and it will be fruitful. And lives will be forever changed. Someone shared with me a story I close with. About a man in Australia. You know, you hear stuff on the internet. And a lot of it's not true. In case you didn't know that. So I checked this out. This is. So there was a preacher in London, England. And he was talking to his church, invited them to share how they came to Christ. And two of the men were in the Navy. And while they were in Australia, ported at Sydney, they were on George Street. And a man came up to them at different times and said, if you died today, would you go to heaven? And gave them a tract. And both of them said they were really offended at this guy who is a stranger walking up, talking about this. One of them said, just come out of the bar half drunk. But both of them started thinking about the question. They read the track. One of them went to the chapel, and another one went to his pastor when he got home. He couldn't get the question out of his mind, and they accepted Christ. The pastor in London, over the next eight or ten years, met about ten or twelve different people that all traced their gospel story back to this street in Sydney, Australia, George Street. And this little old man that would walk up to them and ask them if they died, would they go to heaven and give them a track? Every one of them said when it first happened, they were ticked off at the guy. But over time, they would ask someone else. They'd read the track. They'd get a Bible. One of them was a missionary in India. One of them was a pastor. One of them was a Navy chaplain who, who was working with, had seen hundreds of his people come to Christ under his ministry. One of them was a native pastor in Asia. And he said, he said it just kind of kept accumulating. So about a decade later, he and his wife were invited to speak at a number of churches in Australia. And everywhere he'd ask, he'd ask if anyone knew of this man. No one did. So finally he was speaking in Sydney, Australia, and he was speaking to a group of pastors, and he asked them if anyone knew who that might be. And one of the guys said, oh, I do. That's probably Mr. Janor. And he said, I want to meet this guy. And so the pastor arranged it, and he and Mr. Janor had tea. And he told Mr. Janor his story, these people he had kept meeting. And Mr. Janor said, let me tell you my story. I was in the Royal Navy. I was a drunk. I was a horrible lived a horrible, wicked life. And we were at port. And I was coming out of a bar, and a man handed me a track. And I read it, and I accepted the message, and God gloriously and radically changed me. And out of gratitude for God and what that man did, I made a decision that every day I was going to try to speak to ten people for Christ. Even if it was just giving out ten tracks. He said, some days my health wouldn't let me, and I would, I'd try to make up for it the other days. And, and at this point, he'd been doing this for about 20 years. And then he said this. He said, up until what you just told me, I never knew if any of those tracks made any difference. I had never heard of one person living for Christ because of that until today. 
you know what? Just because you don't see the seed produced today doesn't mean it's not going to produce. Don't forget the law of the harvest. Keep planting seeds. Keep ministering. Keep serving. Don't get discouraged because you haven't seen fruit yet. Keep trusting the law of the harvest. Keep sowing seeds. Some of that seed is going to fall places you would never have imagined. There are some seeds that are going to catch on to some soil that you never would have thought. Keep sowing seed. And trust God with the harvest. As Dan comes, I just want to challenge you. How's your heart? Maybe today you need to just pray and say, Lord, how is my heart doing? Is it hard? Is it rocky? Is it filled with weeds? I learned the best time to pull up the weeds is when they're small. Start pulling the weeds. Maybe you're here today and maybe what God's telling you to do is to start sowing seeds again. You used to do that. And you bought in the lie that the gospel doesn't work anymore. You bought in the lie that evangelism doesn't work. You bought in the lie that you hadn't seen fruit, therefore it must be fruitless. And today God's saying, look, it's time to start trusting the law of the harvest again. Start planting seeds. Start sowing seeds. And trust that in his time God will give the increase. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'd love to talk with you. We'll be in the back. And today could be the day. If he's speaking to you today, respond. Father, we come before you today. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it does not return to void. And we pray that you would be glorified in it. In Christ's name, amen.